My name is Richard A. Colodi. I will be 96 in February the 14th of next year. And uh, I graduated from high school in Dallas, Texas in 19, May of 1942. And a little later that summer, I joined the Marine Corps. And after boot camp, we took tests and one other fellow from Big Springs, Texas, and I got into aviation. They sent us to North Island there in San Diego Bay, and I got put in the 1st Marine Air Wing and started training to fly in the Pacific. They sent me from there after I stayed there about a month. We went to Norman, Oklahoma, where we had a Marine Air Base, and we started training all kind of things. I even had to learn to check out 16 words a minute in Morse code back in them days. They had a Morse code key in our first planes, the first ones they had. And no radar, of course, but we trained for about, oh, almost five months, four months, something like that, a little over at Norman. Everything from shooting 50 caliber machine guns and all kind of weapons and that. And they give us a 10 day furlough. I went home to Dallas and, and stayed nine days and went over to Eagle Mountain Lake Fort Worth then and caught a plane and flew to San Diego. My, when I left and joined the Marines, I had to ride the train for four days and nights from Dallas to San Diego. But I could fly after I got into flying. So I flew back and we about three weeks later we caught a troop transport ship and sailed to New Caledonia. It took us 17 days and nights of zigzagging down through the South Pacific to get to New Caledonia. And you zigzag because of Jap submarines. You tried to miss that, which were luckily we didn't have any problems. But uh, I landed at New Caledonia and the, our airplanes and Marine Marine Air Base was at New Hebrides, which is about 300 miles north of New Caledonia, is 300 miles north of Australia, and then another 300 miles you about you got New Caledonia. Well, we caught an LST like they built in Evansville, Indiana, and traveled up to get to our airplanes, which was a TBM Avenger. At that point, it was not a TBM; it was still a TBF. That's the first for the first two years they made them. They were TBFs. And that's what I was put in as a radio gunner. And I spent the next 13 months flying from, from New Hebrides. We flew up to Guadalcanal. And my first flight was a hit in Munda up there off of Guadalcanal. It was just fixing to take Munda. They'd already secured Henderson Field because they, of course, August 7th, you know, they landed at Guadalcanal and, and that in 42. And they had, they had got Henderson Field secured, and we had moved our planes and that. And we had three groups of planes. I was put in BMTB-233, which is a TBF squadron, or TBM now. They had a, a squadron of SBD Dauntless dive bombers and a squadron of S4U Corsair fighter flight. Uh, the TBFs, the first ones, after a while, in, in October of 42, we went back down and got a bunch of new planes with electric turrets and they even had a nine, about a nine, ten inch square radar screen in it, which was the first radar we had. All it had was a ring sight blip and you couldn't see more than about 20 miles out. But you couldn't tell what it was, all you could see is something was out there. You, you took these classes where they flash planes of all kind and ships of all kind on a screen as fast as 1 25th of a second and you're supposed to learn to recognize them whether it's a Jap or American and that and it's amazing but when you used to do that for six weeks eight weeks whatever it was we had it every class every day they'd show a Jap plane on there and, or, and then they might show American might even show an English plane or you know something like that but you had to learn to identif identification, plane identification, and ship identification. And 
course, I don't remember all of it now. I would, couldn't even see a 125th shot now. But you get down to where you can recognize a jet plane in a 25th of a second when it's flashed on the screen. And we went down to the strip that first day, the next, second day we was there. And he said, climb in, boys. We're going to take a flight. And, and we took off, and we started learning it. And one, one of us would get up in the turret one time, one time training. And that, we also had some planes pulling some targets out there over the ocean because the Japs wasn't right around New Caledonia and New Hebrides. They were up at Guadalcanal another 300 miles or so. We just started training and technically we didn't have a whole lot of training before we made the first mission and shooting at Japs. The TBM was really originally made to drop 14 foot torpedoes. It had a Fort Long Bombay and that. But the Marine Corps had started dropping 2,000 pound bombs and instead of a straight-in bomber, we used it for a dive bomber. Dive bomber about 70 degrees. And the SVD went straight down. But we went go in like that and pull up and out. And, and we would either you'd drop a 2,000 pounder or four five hundreds, or you could shackle 1,200 pounders in it, which we later on at Bougainville, only time we used them was when they tried to retake Bougainville and we we was bombing their lines in the jungle, and we was running 1,200 pounders with a thing on the end so they'd go off above the ground like, like a grenade. And we would go in at eight, 900 feet and drop them 100 pound bombs down through there, through the jungle. And we would fly every, every third day, sometimes every other day. I'd flown three missions in one day, a couple of times, three times, when we was bombing those 100 pounders. We bomb early, come back in, load up, and eat a bite, go bomb again, and then in the afternoon bomb the third time. Three missions a day, three days in a row. There we made we made nine missions in three three days. Uh, actually, we had not gone up to seven, eight thousand, nine thousand feet. Uh, at that point, we'd only been going lower, just flying. But we went up to about eight thousand feet and peeled off and come down and laid one. We didn't hit the strip that day. The first run was on some kind of buildings back in the jungle, kind of. Of course, I was in the belly that first run, and I had to miss that 30 caliber, and we used to come out. I was shooting at something. I don't know what it was. But we was, Turk Gunner was shooting, and I was shooting. Of course, the Japs had ACAC guns. They were shooting at it. And the fighter planes were coverage. They were chasing the Zeros off. The F-4Us flew above us. And when the zeros come in, they'd come down on them, and that, yeah. and and they they had a terrific about a fifteen to one ratio. Every Jap plane shoot us down, we'd shoot fifteen or twelve, fourteen, fifteen Jap zeros down. I flew sixty missions in January, February, March of '44. I flew sixty missions in three months. That's almost every other day. Monday. Didn't take us very long. It didn't take very long. In fact, Monday was just about ready for the troops. They, not a week after I made that first run, I think the 1st or 2nd Marine Division landed there at Monday's airstrip, drove the Japs back, and the CBs started doing the strip again. We go in and tear up the strips. The CBs have to come in and redo them. Isn't that something? But they, they had Monday fix it. It didn't take them two or three weeks to get Monday and that because we moved up from Guadalcanal to Munda, not, oh, it was within six weeks. I wasn't on Henderson Field more than six weeks. And we moved to Munda, and that was the most used base in the, in the Solomons after that because it had the longest runway. But there were no big planes out there. Now, B-24s could land on Munda, but that's the only strip long enough to handle a big plane. They all in strips were about 4,000 feet. You had to get down and get up. And, and in fact, I was in the, only, the first plane to land on Andonga when they got it. That's past Munda, the next place. Munda, and then Andonga, and then Colmagar, and then Bougainville. And I, I, our plane, the guy that flew, my, I flew with most of the time, from Roberts, I think it was, uh, he got kicked out to go try the strip to see if it, we could land on it, land on it and take off. So I was in the first plane to land on Ndanga.
We had dang good pilots. Our pilots were absolutely fearless and excellent. So when you were there, how did you stay in touch with your family? <laughs> Write them a letter, and they censored them. And mother saved some of the letters, and they'd cut out stuff in the letters, not wanting you to tell the Japs where we were. I don't know why they'd done that, because they'd bombed us every day or two. <laughs> now, why would, why would they not want to tell the Japs where we were? They knew where we were. <laughs> you know, it's kind of silly. The Japs sank one of our troop ships as bringing us a bunch of food. We went ten, about 10 days without anything. We even killed a lizard and tried to fry the legs on lizards. <laughs> and we got down to, they had some flour and water and made us some kind of a, a pancake like biscuit or something. And we made out though. It, we were hungry. Boy, when we got that food ship, they, the, the mess hall. That's one thing about flying. The mess hall stayed open 24 hours a day because you might fly at midnight, you might fly at one o'clock, you might fly at four, you might fly at six o'clock. You didn't know when you was flying until they posted it. Most of the flights were, most of them were daylight flights, but I had several night flights. One humorous event was on Monday, we was in chow line one afternoon and I heard a commotion going on down behind me and looked down there and there's a Jap had sandals and shorts on. He had gotten to come in out of the mountains and gotten in our food line and kept pouting to his mouth. He was hungry. But this guy got in there and everybody was laughing. He was kept saying hungry and rubbing his belly. Yeah, he he got hungry to come out of them mountains. Did y'all play pranks on any, each other? Oh yeah, yeah, you'd put, they had a lot of, oh, the mountains full of snakes and big land crabs and we'd put a big land crab down in the guy's bed. He'd come in and crawl in that land crab. <laughs> we had fun. Uh, we tried to do everything. We were on Bougainville. Well, after we got to Ondaga, we moved up to Bougainville and and uh, started. We were within range then of Verbal, which was the main base of the Japanese in the South Pacific. That was the best time. They had five airstrips and over 350 airplanes and over 100,000 personnel there and it was arranged in a bay with ACAC guns and searchlights all around it and it was a very formidable place that we had to knock out. I say we, I'm talking about three squadrons now, not just the I squadron but the SBDs and the F4Us. It took three outfits, not one, but three to do it. Plus, Every now and then, they would send an aircraft carrier within distance and make a bomb and run on their ball. They, several times, they had aircraft carriers. Also, uh, two or three cruisers cruised in there and bombed them from out in the bay. But they took chances of getting sunk by the Jap bombers, you know. But anyway, uh, as it got better and knocked out the airstrip. But once we started flying on their ball, uh, the first flight we made, three flights went out the same day at, from, from Bougainville. We hit three airstrips. First thing you knocked out was airstrip, so the Japs couldn't bomb you or get fighter planes off. You bombed the airstrips. Then you went for their gun, guns and the other, other stuff, you know, any ships in the bays or any ships. And Japs didn't have no ships out there. We sank everything and that. But uh, one mission, we had bombing buildings. We had four or five hundred pound bombs in the bomb bay. Well, we made our bombing run, and the bomb bay doors wouldn't go shut because one back shackle bomb was hanging down on the shackle. It didn't release. Well, he tried to shake it loose, and of course, we got out of there as fast as we could with the bomb bays open. And usually, when you come out of your run, you got on top of the jungle or on top of the ocean, as low as you could go. We've actually had water from the propeller in the Bombay. Actually, you wouldn't believe it, but we was on top of the ocean. That was the Japs, the reason for that, the Japs weren't smart. They dug all their ACAP guns down in a hole so we couldn't hit them. Well, they couldn't bring their guns down to shoot level. So we'd get down below, they'd be shooting above us, and we was down below them going out. That's why we'd stay on, on top of the jungle, that or we'd come out and run. And we'd come out, you'd peel off about eight, any further above eight, nine thousand feet, 
And the reason for above that was the Jap ak ak guns wouldn't go higher than about 9,000 feet. So we come in above the ak ak guns. They didn't even shoot at us till we got down into the run. But we had come down from 10, 8, 10, 12,000 feet sometime. Come down about 2,500 feet, the pilot popped the bomb base. He had the button for the bomb base. And they were real fast hydraulic opening bomb bays. They didn't take them two or three seconds to open. He had popped them open, and about 1,500 feet, you'd start to pull out and release your bomb. He had a ring sight that he used to try to hit the target. As soon as that bomb bay bomb got out of there, he'd pull up and start closing them bomb bays. Sometimes you'd be out over the ocean, and before, before he could get them closed, you'd be down over water or something, or if he was bombing a ship, you know. But anyway, then you'd come out and try to get this low as you could as you are coming out. And one, one time coming, we made a run straight into, into uh, the bay there at Rabaul. Simpson Harbor Bay, right it straight into it. There, there was a Jap. I was, I was on the, in the turret that day, and this Jap was on a barge, looked like a barge there, shooting at us. I turned that turret gun on. He had 50 caliber on him. I could see pieces flying from the barge, and the Jap jumped off and jumped in the water. <laughs> and then we were past him by then. But I could see pieces flying over that barge. And he didn't want to get shot. The bomb getting back to the bomb. We had to fly all the way back, and we was out there in the bay at Peaver Uncle or Augusta Bay. And we was at about 2,000 feet trying to shake that bomb loose so we wouldn't get in a blast. Finally, he said, boys, get your parachutes on. I'm going to go up about 4,000 feet. We'll have to jump. Looks like my head out in the ocean and ditch. Well, we got up about 4,000 feet, and we was about to run out of gas. And he said, I'm going to give it one more big shake, hang on. And he shook the heck out of that plane. I mean, he really jerked, hit that button, and the bomb come out. We got back, we didn't have not even five minutes of gas left, I don't guess. We were just about out of gas. Well, I got the radio shot out. I was in the belly that day, and about that far in front of me, all of a sudden this Jap Zero shot right through the, shot all the radio out, and I couldn't even talk to the pilot the rest of the time. I mean, it just shot the heck out of me. If I'd have been foot further, I'd have probably got, I'd have got shot, I guess. Yeah. In fact, the gunner on the turf got his leg shot one time. I put a belt around it and got him down out of there and got him down on the bottom, and I climbed up in the turf and, and uh, flew the rest of it up in the turf. He wasn't bleeding too bad at that point. He got his leg shot. And it wasn't really bad. It was kind of on a edge, you know, but it was bleeding. I put, took my belt off and put it around him and tightened it up and uh, stopped the bleeding pretty good. Squadron shot 10 Jap planes down as a squadron, but you got to remember at least six planes, of, we flew in groups of six. You could go 18 planes, three groups of six, one and two. And uh, there might be 10 planes shooting at this uh, Jap, so you don't know who actually hit it. but. We shot, the squadron shot 10 planes down and sank 35 ships. And you hit them good burst in, in a zero and they'd disintegrate. They didn't have hardly no armament and they, it was an honor to die in a zero. They would try to, they'd try to ram you. Did you lose any friends over there? Yeah, I lost my best buddy, I'd call him a Gary. I watched him go in the jungle and the plane exploded. Leroy Klug from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and he's a little older than me. He was 22 or 3, but he was really good. He got shot down. And then other guys, you know. We lost 18 on that mine lane in the hospital. After I got back to the States, I got my 30-day furlough after a couple weeks. I flew from San Diego to Eagle Mountain, Fort Worth at the Naval Air Station, and Mother and them picked me up. They drove out there and picked me up and we went back to Dallas, and I had my 30-day furlough, and at the end of that I had to check in and go to Cherry Point Marine Air Base. The Marines had started flying at that time, had started flying B-25s. I got put in a B-25 squadron and I, at Cherry Point, and then we had an air base at Kinston between 
Cherry Point and Raleigh, North Carolina, which is the capital. So I flew either at Cherry Point or Kingston. We landed both trips and that. I flew there for about three months before I got flying, flight training. We used to fly up to Washington, D.C. on the weekend, land and stay overnight and go to town, fly someplace, fly them B-25s. I didn't like it like I liked the TDM. I liked that TDM. So when you got out, uh, what did you do when you came back home? Uh, went to work at A&P Grocery. I, I had worked in high school two years at A&P in Dallas and moved to Madisonville and we... Uh, uh, Looked around and I could have gone to work in the coal mines, the bank, the railroad. I saw the A&P store down there and I said, well, heck, I know how to do that stuff. And it turned out I wound up working for him 36 years. No more talking about it. The way it is, the way it is. It's no mystery. There's no getting around it When you're here, when you're here We got chemistry When 